uh, 10 o'clock sharp. I'm sure we'll have uh, people uh, coming in uh, as we're talking, but I just want to say uh, welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have, uh, you know, some great uh, real estate uh, professionals uh, on our uh, session today uh, in the Chicagoland community. So we're really uh, we're really proud and happy to be able to support your efforts uh, through just the continued education, knowledge, exposing you to uh, Anna and the 1031 Exchange Program, if you haven't met her before or uh, know much about it, and also be having an opportunity to have some of our uh, really valued uh, and trusted partners that uh, work closely with Land Trust be able to share uh, from their expertise as well. We have some operations people from Land Trust on. Welcome. We have our great uh, salespeople. Uh, so welcome to them as well. Um, so anyway, without further ado, let me introduce Anna. Anna is the Vice President and a Business Development Officer for IPX 1031 Exchange. Uh, she's worked in the 1031 Exchange industry for over 15 years, facilitated over 2,500 exchanges just last year. Um, Anna can work the, the simple ones, and she's been a part of the complex ones as well. So nothing's too difficult or too small of a task uh, for Anna to handle. And I know myself, you know, one of the reasons I we we uh, brought Anna on is I've referred, you know, multiple clients, attorneys, buyers, sellers uh, to Anna. And, um, you know, not all the time, but you know, do I, I hear back from them, but many times I hear back and go, wow, she was great. She was so professional. She was so responsive. And so we're just glad to have Anna as a resource. And we're glad to Anna that you, for you to be able to share your expertise with us. And then we'll have our, um, our uh, panelists uh, that we'll introduce, uh, you know, kind of chip in at the end. However, I do want to let you know that there's a few things that can make your viewing experience uh, more, um, you know, whatever, uh, helpful. You have the, you have the view up in the right hand where you can view, uh, you can, uh, you can dictate your view a number of different ways to get the most out of it. And then if you have questions uh, or, um, whatever, you can just pop it into the Q and A and I will monitor that and just do that in real time. Like Anna said, we'd love for this to be discussion, a discussion type of thing and conversational. And so feel free. This is kind of just you know, free flowing, and we want to make sure that you come away from this with the questions that you might have uh, answered. So, without further ado, Anna Barsky, uh, Anna, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, and My thank pleasure. you everyone for taking time out of your day to learn a little bit more about 1031 exchanges. Uh, nothing like a little tax talk to really, you know, get your energy going <laughs> first thing in the morning. As Steve said, I'm Anna Barsky. I work for a 1031 exchange qualified intermediary called IPX 1031. We're a wholly owned subsidiary of f and and we're the largest 1031 exchange company in the country. We have 150 employees nationwide, 13 regional offices all across the country. And as a company, we do over 45,000 1031 exchanges every single year. So this is the only service that we offer, uh, the only product that, that we provide. And um, the, the presentation today is a overview of some of the basic 1031 guidelines, the benefits of the 1031 exchange, um, a couple of little more complex issues thrown in there. But really the goal of today is to uh, let you know that I'm here to be your 1031 resource. Uh, answer any questions that you have, and hopefully give you a couple of tools to be able to spot 1031 opportunities within your customer base, because the, the realtors and brokers that I work with actually use 1031s to increase their business. And the reason they're able to do that is because if you have a client that's working on a 1031 exchange, you get to work with that same client on two transactions, a sale and a buy, in a very, very short time frame. So I have a PowerPoint here that I am going to uh, put up, um, and uh, the, the PowerPoint is, is very fluid, so um, I'm going to talk you through it. However, if any questions pop up, please, please feel free to ask in the box. Um, so as many of you know, uh, 1031 Exchange is called a 1031 exchange because it's part of section 1031 of the IRS code. And it's sometimes seen as the last tax loophole out there for real estate investors. 
So essentially what the IRS says is that if you're selling a piece of investment real estate and you have a profit on that sale, you could defer paying the taxes on that profit by purchasing another piece of investment real estate in a specific time frame. So super easy, let's say uh, Steve purchases an apartment building, um, he buys it for $500,000, he bought it three years ago, he's now selling it for $700,000. The government is of course gonna tax Steve on the $200,000 profit that he made, right? We live in the US, you make money, you gotta pay taxes. Uh, in order to defer the tax payment on that $200,000 profit, all that Steve has to do is buy another apartment building or any other piece of investment real estate. So really all that a 1031 exchange is, is a sale plus a purchase equals a tax deferral. And in our industry, especially, we see folks try to kind of overcomplicate a 1031 exchange. And there are some specific details that you really need to hone in on. But that's really all that it is. It's a sale plus a buy equals no tax payment equals a tax deferral. And there's several taxes that are deferred through a 1031 exchange. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with capital gains tax, which is either 15% or 20%, depending on the taxpayer's income. Uh, depreciation recapture tax is one that I find most clients forget about. Uh, so when you own a piece of property, you spread the cost of the property throughout the time that you own it by taking a depreciation on your tax return. But when you sell the property, the government recaptures some of that depreciation through tax. And that's taxed at 25%. Uh, the 3.8% healthcare tax that came into effect in 2013 affects almost all real estate investors out there. State taxes are also deferred through a 1031 exchange. So when you kind of wrap all these taxes up, depending on how much depreciation has been taken, what state you're in, most real estate investors who sell property that don't do exchanges are paying anywhere from 28 to 35 percent in taxes on the profits from their sale. And the 1031 is the only solution out there to get this full tax benefit and full tax deferral. Um, in my earlier example, you know, because Steve wasn't hit with that tax up front, he's now able to purchase a new property that's a lot higher in value than the property that he sold. So a lot of the clients that I've worked with for the last 10, 15 years, maybe started out with a $500,000 asset. They've been able to build their portfolio and now have a $2 million real estate portfolio. And they were able to do that rather quickly because they're not paying taxes every single time they sell a piece of property. So that money they would have used to make that tax payment is now going back into the new piece of real estate so they could buy something bigger and better and really grow their wealth and grow that real estate portfolio. Um, some of you may have heard 1031s referred to as like-kind exchanges. And that's because uh, one of the rules is you know, the property that you're buying has to be like-kind to the property that you're selling. The good news about that rule is that it's fairly flexible. So all investment real estate is like kind and can be exchanged for any other type of investment real estate. So you could sell a rental condo and buy a piece of vacant land. You could sell a commercial property and buy a, an apartment building. You could sell a single family home that you're using for rental purposes and buy an interest in an industrial warehouse. All investment real estate is like kind and can be exchanged for any other type of investment real estate within the U.S. So a lot of the times we see folks use 1031s because they want to diversify their real estate portfolio. Maybe they're not getting the cash flow they, they want to see on their residential investments. So they sell some of those off and buy into a commercial asset. Maybe they're relocating. Um, you know, they, they are moving from Chicago to California. They have an investment property here in Chicago. They don't want to have to worry about managing that from California. So they're going to sell their investment property here, do a 1031 exchange, get a great tax deferral, and then buy a property in Florida that's easier to manage. Um, also, we see folks that are want to get out of Anna, managing Anna, property. Anna, yeah. Anna, excuse me. Someone asked, is the 1031 only for properties that have been depreciated? Um, no, they're for any type of investment real estate um, that's being sold at a profit. Great. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Good question. Good question. 
um, a lot of times we see folks want to get out of managing real estate, right? So they have several single family homes or condos or small apartment buildings that, that they've been renting. They don't want to have to worry about tenants anymore, but they could sell those properties off, do a 1031 exchange, again, get the tax deferral, and then buy into an asset that they don't have to manage like a triple net lease property or a DST product. And that way they're still getting a tax deferral and great cash flow on their new investment. They've kind of gone into a different type of real estate because they want to get out of, out of management. So I say that to say the, the exchange and there's not many areas where the 1031 rules are flexible, but the like kind requirements you are able to move into different types of real estate, depending on what you're looking for from a cash flow perspective, uh, management perspective, and location. Um, you can consolidate a real estate portfolio with the 1031 exchange as well. So if you have several properties uh, that that you're, you're, you own or are looking to sell, you could sell those properties and then buy one big property to complete your exchange. Or you can expand your real estate portfolio with the 1031. You can um, sell one big property and buy you know, several smaller properties to complete the exchange. So again, some, some flexibility there. Another powerful tool uh, within the, the exchange strategy is using it for tax planning purposes. So you've heard me say the word deferral throughout the presentation, and that's because it, it's not a tax avoidance. A 1031 is a tax deferral mechanism. However, uh, the, the way to get the tax avoidance, as morbid as this sounds, is when you die. So when an investor passes away, his or her beneficiaries, kids, whoever they leave their property to, get what we call a step up in basis. They inherit the property at the current value and avoid all the taxes that the investor has been deferring throughout his or her life. And we like to call that swap till you drop because we think we're really cute and funny. And that's about as funny as we get in the tax world, by the way. But um, the swap till you drop method is a great strategy from an estate planning perspective, especially for uh, folks that are a little bit older that, that own real property. Because if they've owned the property for a long time, there's a tons of depreciation, or maybe they exchanged into the property. So now there's a good amount of tax liability already built in. Um, they probably can't afford to cash out. So just to give you a quick example, again, with my example with Steve, where he bought his $500,000 asset, sold it for $700,000, did a 1031 exchange, got a tax deferral. Maybe then a couple of years later, he sold that property for $800,000. He does another exchange, buys a $900,000 asset. Let's say Steve does this for the next 20 years, and he ends up with a $2 million asset. If Steve sells his $2 million asset, he has a $1.5 million profit. Why? Because he has to go back to the cost basis or the value of the original $500,000 asset that he started with years and years ago. That's why it's a tax deferral and not a tax avoidance. However, if Steve passes away, God forbid, and leaves his property to, to Felix, uh, his, his, his favorite attorney, Felix inherits the property at the $2 million value at the current value, and he doesn't have to pay any of the taxes on the profits that Steve had deferred throughout his or her life. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a, a, a numerical example of really the power of the swap till you drop, um, the power of the 1031 exchange for older investors, and a little bit of insight as to why it's a tax deferral and not a tax avoidance. So any questions on that, let me know, because I know that can be a little confusing. Um, some of the properties that you can exchange. Any type of investment real estate qualifies for 1031 treatment. So if you are working with a client and they're asking you to list their property and it is not owner-occupied, it is most likely a 1031 opportunity. Any uh, residential property that is being used for rental purposes qualifies for 1031 treatment. It could be a condominium, a single family home, a two flat, all of those assets that they're being rented qualify for a 1031 exchange. Any type of commercial asset qualifies. So it could be retail, it could be medical office, it could be industrial, uh, vacant land, farmland qualify for 1031 treatment. Uh, a tick interest or a DST interest qualify. So really what that means is you don't have to be selling or buying 100% of an asset in order to qualify for a 1031 exchange. Um, you can potentially sell property. If I own property, you know, with Felix, he owns 50%, I own 50%. 
we're on title as tenants in common. If I want to do a 1031 exchange and Felix wants to take his money and pay his taxes, we have that flexibility. Or if I'm selling property on my own, but I want to buy property with a partner to complete my exchange, I can do that again through a tenancy in common structure. Um, there are some specific rules on vacation homes and second homes. Um, let me see if I have a slide on that. I don't. Um, so a couple of years ago, the IRS cracked down on vacation homes and second homes because what a lot of investors were doing is they were selling their rental property, doing a 1031 exchange, buying another rental property. And a couple of years later, they would do the same thing. And then when they were nearing retirement, retirement, they would sell their last rental property and then buy a vacation home uh, to complete their exchange. And uh, the vacation home wouldn't be used for rental purposes. They would personally use it. Their family would use it. And the IRS finally said, well, I, we understand this isn't your primary residence, but it's also not really an investment because there's no cash flow coming from the property. And so now there's a couple of rules that you have to follow in order for a second home or vacation home to qualify for 1031 treatment. One, there's a two-year holding period requirement. Within those two years, the property has to be rented for at least 14 days, and you have to limit your use to the property to either 14 days or 10% of the amount of days the property is rented, whichever is greater. Um, Can you say that one more time, uh, Anna, please? Sure. So two you, have year to rent, you, have to rent it, you have to rent it for 14 days? 14 days per year. And then you have to limit your use to either 14 days or 10% of the amount of days the property is rented. So essentially, the more you rent it, the more you can use it. So if you rent it for, let's say, 200 days, you can use it for 20. Um, but there is a limitation to personal use and a minimum rental period uh, requirement as well. Okay, thank you. Um, and that goes for both uh, if you're selling a vacation home and looking to, to do an exchange on that property and get a deferral on that property, or if you're buying a vacation home to complete the, the 1031 exchange. Uh, some of the properties that don't qualify for 1031 treatment, money, cash, any kind of cash equivalents, uh, stocks, bonds, notes do not qualify. Um, property held primarily for resale doesn't qualify for 1031 treatment. So this particular rule speaks directly to flippers and developers. So if you have clients that buy a building or buy a single family home, they fix it up and then you know sell it, uh, your traditional flipper doesn't qualify, is not a good candidate for a 1031 exchange because of this rule. The IRS sees those types of taxpayers as owning inventory as opposed to owning investment real estate. And the, the question I always get around this point is, okay, well, are there any holding period requirements? How long does my client have to hold the property in order for it to qualify for 1031 treatment? And that's kind of the tricky part is, you know, there really are no holding period requirements. It's all about your intent, which I know can be difficult to measure, right? Um, so if your intent is to hold the property for long-term investment purposes, absolutely works for a 1031 exchange. If your intent is buy, rehab, sell, and you have a pattern of doing that, and that's your main business or even your side business, and you don't own any rental property, then you probably don't qualify for a 1031 exchange. Within that, there is some gray area though, right? So one example I like to give is, let's say you have a client that purchases a single family home, they lease the property, um, and then two months after they've leased it, someone sees it, falls in love with the property, gives your client an offer they can't refuse. Should they do a 1031 exchange, they've only owned the property for two months. I say absolutely, right? Because they didn't, uh, they didn't solicit the sale. So their intent was obviously to hold on to it for long term. They leased the property showing that intent. So I think that is a great 1031, even though the holding period is, is rather short. Um, so like I said, definitely some gray area in between all of these different scenarios. We kind of treat it as a case by case uh, when, it, when this issue comes up. Most CPAs, um, most of the conservative CPAs will tell you that the general rule of thumb is two years. 
So if you've held on to a property for two years, reported it on two tax returns as investment, the IRS can't make an argument that it's not investment real estate. But technically speaking, there are no holding period requirements. Um, unless it's uh, Anna, can I pause, Anna, can I pause you for a second? You know, we have Juan Hernandez, who is a founder and managing partner of HHM, and he's been 15 years public accounting. Uh, Juan, is there anything you want to add to this or any nuance you want to chip in? Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, Stephen, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to back what uh, Anna has just mentioned. I mean, the most CPAs out there, you know, they use the two-year rule of thumb. But um, as Anna mentioned, there is, if you read the 1031, you know, either the code or the regulations, there is nothing in there that specifies any particular holding period. It's all based on intent. So if you can prove that you had the intent of <clears throat> holding this property as an investment property from day one, and you got a phenomenal deal on day two, and you you ended up selling it, you know, in Anna's example, they held it for two months. Um, I'm fully on board as well that that would be a perfect uh, candidate for a 1031 exchange. Uh, but again, I mean, there is no uh, there is no two year requirement, um, you know, in, in the technical sense. Uh, it's it's on a case by case basis, and ultimately, what you have to prove is you have to prove intent. So you have to make sure that it's well documented, um, and um, you know whatever records you have, they have to be contemporaneous too, which is a, a pretty big deal in the IRS audit. Okay, great, thank you. And I, I think now would be a good time, uh, Felix. Uh, uh, Felix is the is the uh, uh, owner of uh, Archer Law. Uh, you know, Felix, how do you work with buyers and sellers in this? And, you know, and how do you, when, how early do you tie in a person like Juan? Well, typically uh, we'll start off with a seller because they're usually going to place the exchange in and then they're going to buy out. And whenever I have a seller that I'm working with, you know, and I do my, you know, initial questions on consultation, if we find out it's an investment property, I'll ask them a few questions about how they've been dealing with their tax liability. And just my general rule here in the office is I say, well, why don't we either do a three-way conference with your accountant, or if you want, just give your accountant a call to help determine whether or not this is an eligible property with the way that you've done the taxes on it. Some mm -hmm. folks do cash. Some folks do all kinds of interesting stuff. So I always think it's a good idea to loop in the accountant as early as possible to determine whether or not the 1031 is gonna provide the client the maximum benefit. And then if that's the case, then we make sure that we add that to the attorney review provisions of the contract, because there are a few documents that need to be signed by the other side as well. So we wanna make sure that we lock in that um, cooperation when it comes to executing documents as we move forward. Awesome, thank you. I appreciate that. All right, Anna, uh, go ahead, continue. Sorry, I just wanted to get in there real quick and then of we'll course, have our, of our other panelists speak. Of course, um, and, and I'm, I'm totally on board with, with, uh, with what, both what Juan and Felix said. We always push our clients to their CPAs first, right? Because we don't have any history of the property or the tax uh, history of, of the actual taxpayer. So step number one, always check in with your CPA. What's the tax liability? What would even be the benefit of doing this 1031 exchange? And then of course, let your attorney know and then we can all kind of coordinate together. Um, primary residences don't qualify for 1031 treatment. That falls under a different section of the IRS code and there's other tax benefits you can take advantage of with primary residences. However, there is a way to purchase an investment property to complete your exchange and then eventually convert it into a primary residence. Uh, there's a couple of rules that have to be followed in order to make that work, but it is absolutely possible. And we, we certainly see a lot of clients kind of go in that direction, especially again, if they're, they're in retirement age. Um, an interest in a partnership, membership interests of an LLC, shares of a corporation, those assets do not qualify for 1031 treatment, even if those entities own property. So if Felix and I are in a partnership, our partnership could do a 1031 exchange because our partnership owns real property. But Felix and I don't have the opportunity or the option of really going our separate ways because we own an interest in a partnership which doesn't qualify for 1031 treatment. 
So the partnership issue, I would say, is probably the most common that comes up. I talk about it at least once a day, every single day. And the scenario is, hey, I'm selling property in a partnership. I'm in a partnership with my brother and my father. I want to do an exchange. My father wants to cash out and pay taxes. My brother wants to do an exchange, but we don't want to buy property together. Anna, how do we structure that type of transaction? And depending on how many partners there are, how many want to do an exchange, how many don't, there's various structures that can be applied. Um, if, if anyone on the call has questions on, on that, I can absolutely dive deeper into it. But I say that to say that this is one thing that we always ask to be flagged as early as possible. Because <laughs> yeah, sorting yeah, through the... Uh, we have someone in the chat asking if you can repeat the part about the LLC again. Sure. Yeah. So the takeaway here, because this is our slide that discusses what is not exchangeable, is that an interest in a partnership, membership interest of an LLC, or sh nor shares of a corporation, need, none of those assets qualify for 1031 treatment. You have to be selling and buying real property in order to qualify for an exchange. Great. And then we have one other question, which is, how long do you have to buy something else? Um. Well, that is a perfect segue into my next Wow, what a so setup. <laughs> um, so one of the 1031 requirements are the 1031 time period. There's two time periods. Both time periods start ticking the day the sale closes. The taxpayer has 45 days from the closing of the sale to identify new property and 180 days or the due date of their tax return to actually complete the 1031 exchange. Um, I would say the 45 day period and the identification rules, which I'll go over here in a minute, I, are by far the number one reason why 1031 exchanges fail. So it's also the number one reason to bring up a 1031 exchange as early as possible, right? So the realtor is on the call, you're, you're the first to know if someone is looking to sell their property. So asking about a 1031 exchange at that point is always a great idea because if you know that your client wants to reinvest the funds and buy a new property, you could start looking for that property right away. You don't have to wait until the sale closes and the clock starts ticking. The biggest tip that I can give to anyone on, you know, anyone that I talk to, everyone on the call is you want to plan ahead as much as possible because those time periods go very, very quickly. Uh, one common question I get, especially in this, you know, market is, you know, I'm really trying to plan ahead for this exchange. I really want to nail down my replacement property so the time periods aren't an issue. Can I sign a contract for the new property before I close on my sale? Can I put down an earnest money deposit on my new property before I close on my sale? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Right, so we want to make sure that the actual closing of the sale occurs before the closing of the purchase, unless you're doing a reverse exchange, but signing a contract does not trigger anything for the exchange. So if you want to kind of get that replacement property lined up, absolutely more power to you. Anna, one other question we have. Thank you, by the way, and thank you for your questions. Um, what are the rules of converting an asset that was purchased with a 1031 exchange to revert it to a primary residence down the road? So there's a two-year minimum rental requirement. So the first two years, at least, the property has to be used for rental purposes. And then there's a five-year holding period requirement in total. So if you use it as a rental for two years, then move into it, you have to live in it for at least three before you can sell it. Uh, usually our clients are going to rent it for, for a couple of years, move into it, and then live in it forever. Um, you know, and get that just like full tax benefit. Um, but that's, that's the minimum five-year holding period requirement, at least the first two years would have to be rental. Great. You know, if I could pause, I want to introduce, uh, Sebastian Kaz. He's the owner of, uh, Sebastian Kaz Law. Uh, Sebastian, are you able to, uh, are, are you able to unmute? Yep. I'm here. Okay, great. Sebastian, this leads me to the question of investors. And I know that you, you're very expert in working with them and, and connecting with uh, agents as well. Are there any special considerations, anything you want to add to the conversation when you're working with investors? Yes. Yeah, so a lot of times the uh, realtors have the conversation that uh, with the clients that they want to do a 1031 exchange, and that doesn't get relayed to me. 
Mm. Um, so it's very important because then they expect to do a 1031 exchange the day or two before closing. Oh. Surprise. Yeah. Yeah. So you got to tee that up sooner, right? Because then it's a big scramble, uh, that kind of thing. So it's, it, you need to bring that out into the conversation early. Yeah. So if, if the realtor is aware of that, there's just, you know, full disclosure, let us know. Um, that way we can start the process and we're not scrambling last minute. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you, Sebastian. I appreciate it. No um, just one more question, Anna. If what she said about placing an offer before closing on the sale, does that change if it is an LLC sale and going to be applied to a primary residence? One of the LLC members will be purchasing. Does that make sense? Yes. So a couple issues there. If only one of the members of the LLC are looking to do a 1031 exchange, uh, you know, we, you'd have to do some restructuring prior to the closing of the sale because a membership interest in an LLC doesn't qualify for 1031 treatment. So you'd have to restructure the ownership to put the member that wants to do an exchange in a position that they own a real estate interest as opposed to membership interest of the LLC. Also, primary residences don't qualify for 1031. So you have to be selling investment real estate and then buying investment real estate to complete the exchange again, it can eventually be converted into a primary residence down the road. Awesome. Thank you. Of course. Uh, okay. If you own a two-unit building, renting one and living in another and planning to purchase another two- to three-unit building, how long do you have to wait to make the next purchase? Uh, so the time periods are the same. And that's the a great question because it's same. actually a very, very common scenario, especially in Chicago. Um, so the time periods and all the rules are the same. The only difference between a property where there is a, a primary residence in addition to the investment units is that you'd have to work with your CPA ahead of time to allocate a value to the primary residence. So that doesn't qualify for 1031 and there's other tax benefits that you could take advantage of for that unit. So that's really the only difference. And then we would ask that the contract include that price allocation and breakdown. So, Anna, I'm waiting for one of these questions for you to answer. I don't know. I've never heard of that, but it doesn't sound like we're going to get there yet. <laughs> yes, Stephen, if I can we'll just uh, yeah, go ahead, Juan. Yeah, I was just going to add something to what, what Anna what Anna mentioned. I mean, in this particular scenario, you absolutely have to bifurcate your interest in a two-unit property. Uh, very important that you talk to your CPA. There's different benefits you can take advantage of under the code. You know, for example, there's a Section 121 exclusion which uh, essentially allows a single taxpayer to exclude up to $250,000 of gain on a gain of their primary residence. Assuming they've lived in it for at least two years out of the last five year, there's a five year look back period. Um, so, you know, there, there's no, if they meet that requirement, there wouldn't be a need to really exchange 100% of the property, nor could they do that because half is personal use. But uh, there is a way to ultimately exclude 100 or de defer half of the gain and exclude half of the other gain on that building, which is ultimately, I think, what the taxpayer really wants to wants to achieve here. Excellent. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Uh, Anna, uh, uh, what, why would anyone do a 1031 exchange or two unit if it was, oh, so there it is. That's the uh, answer to that, uh, Juan. Thank you for chipping in. Yep. Was that satisfied? It's anonymous in attendee, but uh, hopefully that satisfies that one. Uh, okay, Anna, continue. Perfect. So since we're talking about the time periods and, and identification, I'm going to go to the next slide real quick and then come back because the next slide talks about the identification rules. But as I mentioned, the number one reason why exchanges fail are the 45-day period and the fact that you're limited to the amount of properties you can identify. And you can only buy what you've identified within the 45 day period. So within that 45 day window, you have a lot of wiggle room, which means you can identify property, revoke an identification, identify something else. But once the 45th day hits, you are stuck with what you've identified. And that's the only properties that you can buy. If you're not able to buy any of those properties on your ID list, it's what we call a failed exchange and you have to pay your taxes. Um, there are limitations to the amount of properties that you can identify. Most folks stick with what we call the three property rule, which basically says if you identify three properties or less, the properties can be any value. 
if you identify more than three properties, there are a couple rules that come into play that limit the identification. So if you're identifying four or more, the aggregate value of what you identify can't exceed twice the value of the property that was sold. So if I sell property for a million dollars and I identify, let's say, five properties, the total value of those five properties cannot exceed $2 million. If it does exceed $2 million, then you've bumped yourself up into the 95% rule, which essentially says you have to buy 95% or basically everything on your identification list. So unless you're fairly certain you could buy everything you've identified, you want to stick within the 200% rule or the three property rule. The 200% rule works very, very well if you're selling one big property and looking to buy a couple smaller properties, because obviously the value of the smaller properties would be a lot less. And the, like I said, the, the three property rule is used the most by far. Uh, the identification process is pretty simple. You just fill out an identification form that we provide. You list the address of the property, sign it, date it, send it to us within the 45-day period. You don't have to have a contract in order to identify property. That's not a requirement. If you have a contract, obviously more power to you because that would increase your chances of being able to buy that property. But a contract or an LOI is not required for a formal identification. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, we're kind of getting into the time of the year where this, this is going to hit some taxpayers. Either have 180 days from the sale to acquire property or the due date of your tax return. So this really applies at the end of the year. If you have a client that's selling December 22 and they typically file their tax return, you know, April 15th, their exchange period will end April 15th, 2023. If they need the full 180 day period, they would simply file for an extension on their tax return. Just something to keep in mind for, for those selling at the end of the year. Uh, some other rules that you have to follow uh, in order to get the full benefit of the exchange, you have to buy property that's equal or greater in value. The value is the contract sales price less standard closing costs, brokers commissions and attorney's fees. So essentially the IRS does expect you to replace your debt in some way on the purchase side. And you have to use all of the proceeds from the sale towards the purchase of the new property. So both rules have to be accomplished in order to get the full tax deferral. It is possible to do a partial exchange. So let's say you have a client that says, gosh, you know, all of my money is tied up with this property. I finally got it sold. I just need to take some cash at the closing of the sale. Can I do that? The answer is yes, it's not all or nothing, but any cash that you're taking is taxable dollar for dollar as profit. Uh, additionally, if you buy a property less in value, the shortfall is taxable dollar for dollar as profit. So if I'm selling for a million and I buy for 800,000, I have a $200,000 profit that I'm paying taxes on. So when I say dollar for dollar, what I mean is there's not a proration or any type of allocation of basis. That entire portion is taxed as profit. So we want to make sure that we're not taking the entire profit off the table. Otherwise, there's no deferral. Um, and uh, we have a question. We have a question. Uh, so if the deal for the property name doesn't go through, how can the 1031 still be applied? if another property has to be chosen, named, purchased instead before selling the 1031 property? So uh, if, if you're still within the 45 day period, you can modify your identification and identify something else. If you're outside of the 45 day period, unfortunately there's no longer a 1031 opportunity if you can't buy one of the properties that was identified. Okay, thank you. You know, at this time, I want to introduce uh, Ernie Rose, who's the managing partner of DKMO Law Firm. And Ernie, maybe you could just speak to some of the things you're hearing here and how your firm also partners uh, with uh, investors and the other professionals that are needed in the 1031 exchange. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, the most important part in all of this, like most things in a real estate transaction, is 
kind of understanding where you fit in the process. And with 1031 exchanges, I think a lot of the times our clients rely on uh, the realtor and the attorney for everything real estate related. And I think that we have all the answers on some of these issues. And um, I do quite a few 1031 exchanges. I've worked with Anna and her team uh, quite frequently. They do a great job. Um, and the most important advice to give is to get them to the right person as quickly as possible. Um, I know, like I said, I feel like I'm pretty comfortable with the 1031 process and I'm learning lots of things today uh, that I didn't know going into the presentation. So uh, you really need to get them in contact with somebody early on. Uh, similar to what Sebastian said earlier, I've had even worse examples where I've gotten to the day of closing the client said, hey, I want to do a 1031 exchange. Do you know anything about that? Uh, I've had it happen after the closing where we've closed and the clients come back and said, why didn't you tell me anything about a 1031 exchange? And so you you, you got to get them in the right place when you know as early as possible. And you want to get them to somebody that you know is going to respond to them. And that's why I like working with Anna and her team is they're going to make me look good. They're going to respond. There's really two things the clients are looking for. They want accurate information, which as you can tell, they, they know their stuff and they want to get answers as quickly as possible because most of these deadlines are, uh, they're not like attorney or inspection review deadlines where you say, hey, we're just going to extend this out five days, right? They're, they're set deadlines. And so you got to act quickly. You got to act promptly. And that's why you want to work with professionals. So I try to get my clients to people who know what they're doing. They do a great job. Uh, I, you know, I field the questions I know the answers to, and otherwise I send them to the accountant or I send them to the exchange company as quickly as possible. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, Anna, we have another question. I appreciate that, Ernie. Uh, if I sell a single family home, can I buy two condos for investment that have a combined value? I was going to ask that question too. Can you combo, combo platter it? Um, can I buy two condos for investment that have a combined higher value but are each worth less than the single family home sold? Uh, yes, absolutely. So if I'm selling property for 500,000, I could buy one property that's 500,000 or I could buy two properties that are 250 each. As long as I'm somehow getting to that $500,000 threshold, that, that absolutely would still work and get you the full deferral. Great, and thank you. You know, we oh, These are great questions, by the way, keep them coming. We have, I don't know if everyone can see, but we have about 60 or so agents on here so we love the questions that you guys are asking yes. so appreciate yes. it Agreed. Okay. I, I love the questions as well so uh, absolutely keep them coming um another rule that you have to follow is you have to maintain taxpayer continuity which is a fancy way of saying that the taxpayer selling the old property has to be the same taxpayer buying the new property so if i'm selling property in a partnership my partnership has to be the taxpayer on the new property if i'm selling property you know, individually, I would be the only taxpayer on the new property. Um, what's, what's kind of important to remember here is that it's a taxpayer issue, not a title holder issue. So there's some flexibility with who the title holder is. The title holder can be different. The taxpayer cannot. So if I'm selling property in my individual name, I could buy my replacement property to complete my exchange in a single member LLC of which I'm the sole member in a revocable trust of which I'm the trustee, in a land trust of which I'm the beneficiary. And all of that works because all of those entities are disregarded or passed through, for lack of a better word, for tax purposes. So I'm still the underlying taxpayer. So again, some flexibility there. I often find that clients kind of get stuck on like, who's who, you know, who was the title holder on, on the property that was sold? We need to make sure that's carried throughout the exchange. That's not necessarily the case. The rule is taxpayer continuity, not necessarily title holder continuity. And another question, thank you. Another question is, uh, can you elaborate on like properties? Yeah, so all investment real estate is like kind to any other investment real estate. Okay. So you can sell a single family home that you're using for rental purposes and then purchase vacant land to complete your exchange or purchase farmland to complete your exchange or purchase a commercial asset or purchase an interest in an industrial building. As long as it's real property and it's being used as investment or being used in the taxpayer's business in some way, it qualifies for 1031 treatment. 
So you can go into different types of asset classes as long as, again, it's investment real property. Great. Hopefully that answers that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, those are really the basics. Um, another rule that you have to follow is you have to hire a 1031 exchange company, which is, of course, what I do. And the reason you have to hire us, there's several reasons, but I always say the most important reason you have to hire us is because the IRS says if you're doing an exchange, you cannot touch the proceeds from your sale. You cannot have constructive receipt of the funds uh, from, from the property that's being sold. The second you do have constructive receipt of the funds, those funds are taxable. So one of our main roles in the transaction is we set up this 1031 bank account to hold the funds in between the sale of the old property and the purchase of the new property. And um, I can't recall who it was. I think it was both actually Ernie and Sebastian who said, well, what, you know, this happens sometimes too late in the game, right? So, um, you know, if you're at the closing table or it's day before closing, your client's like, hey, by the way, I need to do an exchange. Uh, do not panic. Give me a call. We can absolutely get the exchange set up at closing. Uh, we might charge you a little bit more, but we will absolutely get it done. However, once the sale closes and that check is cut to the client, they walk away with their funds. There's absolutely nothing that I can do to save that transaction. So a lot of times when I do training for newer realtors, they're like, Anna, what do I do to not totally mess up, you know, this 1031 exchange? And I always say the only way you can mess it up is if you let your client walk away from the closing with the funds, because at that point, there's absolutely nothing that I can do to, to save that 1031 exchange. So and, we Anna, can move... Anna, excuse me. Another question that someone's asking is uh, domestic or foreign cannot cross. You cannot. So is it true that you're, you, yes. you're not, a, you, you can't buy, you can't sell a foreign property and exchange it for a domestic one? That's absolutely correct. So one of the lifetime requirements is domestic for domestic, foreign for foreign. Yep, okay, that's great. 100% correct, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, we like to get involved as early as possible in the process. We know sometimes that doesn't happen. So just get us involved before the sale closes and we will move as quickly as we need to to get the exchange account set up. Um, in addition to holding the funds, we also draft all the 1031 documents and forms that the IRS requires, and then we help guide you, your client, uh, their CPA, their attorney through the process. So I would say, you know, 60% of the exchanges that we do are fairly, you know, vanilla, for lack of a better word, where there's a sale, an identification, and then an acquisition. But about 40% of the exchanges that we do involve some type of a complex issue. And that's really where we dive in and serve in a little bit more of an advisory role, where we would coordinate a little bit more with your CPA and attorney to come up with a structure that works best to fit the transaction. This slide outlines some of the more common 1031 kind of complex structures. There's, there's definitely more, but the ones we see more are related party issues. So if your client is doing a you know, swap with a relative or related entity, or if they're buying their replacement property with a relative or related entity, there are some rules that have to be followed in order to make the exchange work. Um, the IRS hates related party transactions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also, if your client is providing seller financing to the buyer, so e either through a traditional you know, loan and note that's being recorded, or if there's an installment contract or a contract for deed, in any scenario where your client is not getting all of the equity up front, that has to be structured in a very, very specific way in order for the value of that financing to also qualify for tax deferral. Um, partnership issues. So as I mentioned before, probably the number one issue that comes up, selling in a partnership, some want to do an exchange, some don't. Again, it's an issue because a partnership interest doesn't qualify for 1031. So we would need to do some restructuring in order to get the partners that want to do an exchange in a position that they own a partnership interest as opposed to an interest or in a position that they own a real estate interest as opposed to an interest in the partnership. Um, Anna, yeah. we have a couple of questions that just buzzed in. So first okay. up, um, what are the typical fees to set up a 1031 exchange, you may, you may have planned on going through that. 
So that's uh, one question and I have one more, but go ahead. Sure. So for a standard, just delayed exchange, we typically charge $1,000 for the sales side of the exchange and then $250 per purchase. Our fee includes a 1031 escrow account, which is a segregated bank account compliant with all the 1031 regulations. Uh, it includes all the 1031 documents and forms. So we draft a complete set of documents for you. And then it includes some insurances that we place on the funds to kind of protect the funds during the exchange period. Um, uh, and I'll talk about reverse and improvement exchanges here super quickly if we have time. Those transactions are a lot more complicated. Uh, so our fees for those start around $6,000. Okay, and then the next question is, can you sell two properties and purchase one so the, kind of the reverse of the sell one by two, can you sell two and purchase one? Uh, yeah. If the combined value of both are equal to the one being purchased. Absolutely, yep. So sometimes, uh, you know, the timing of that could be tricky. And then also if the ownership is different, you know, if the, both properties are owned by the same taxpayer, that's fairly easy. But if the properties have different taxpayers, um, we just have to structure it correctly to make it work for both taxpayers. But generally speaking, the answer to that is yes. Great. Good questions. Um, so I'll finish just super quickly uh, by talking about reverse and improvement exchanges. Uh, we, we sometimes refer to these type of exchanges as parking transactions. And that's because in, in a reverse and improvement exchange, we as the 1031 company actually come into the chain of title and we park the property. Um, there are specific revenue procedures that came out for both types of exchanges in the, in the early 2000s. Um, and I would say, you know, as a company, we probably do, you know, whatever it works out to be, four, 3,000 exchanges a month. Um, I would say about 250 of those are reverses. So it's not as popular of a tool, but it's still a great tool to use if you happen to be in the specific scenario that really uh, where, where, this, where this would be needed. So reverse exchange is a situation where you have to close on your purchase before you're able to close on your sale. Maybe you don't have a buyer for the property you're selling or you have a buyer and the buyer says, gosh, you know, my financing fell off. I need 60 more days to come up with a new lender, but you have found the perfect replacement property and the seller of that property says, well, I have four other offers. So if you want to buy my property, we have to close in 30 days you'd be in a situation that you have to do a reverse exchange. The way that the revenue procedure is written for reverse exchanges, the IRS doesn't allow the taxpayer to have ownership of both the old property and the new property at the same time. So that's why there's a requirement for us as the 1031 company to come into the chain of title. So we would be the initial buyer of the replacement property in a reverse exchange. Um, this chart kind of outlines uh, a little bit of the process um, and there's a lot of like industry <laughs> lingo in here, but essentially we are the EAT, which stands for Exchange Accommodation Title Holder. And the EAT is an LLC that we set up to hold the replacement property. We are initially the sole member of that LLC and your client would either take out a loan or they would contribute their own cash to have us buy that replacement property for them. While we're on title to the replacement property, we issue a triple net lease, which essentially means the client has all access, all responsibility to the property. For all intents and purposes, they're really the owner. We're just simply the title holder for the purposes of facilitating this reverse exchange. How many of these do you do a year, Anna? I mean, thousands. I think we do about like wow. 200, 250 a month of the reverses. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's not as popular because it's more expensive. You have to be in a very particular type of situation in order to really go down this road. Right. But depending on the scenario, it really works well for some clients. Like we have some clients that only do reverse exchanges. So. And how long, how long do you have to spend with the client so that they understand this? Um, we really rely heavily on uh, their attorney and CPA in, in right. these scenarios. Like usually... 
clients, you know, in Illinois, because I also cover Wisconsin and Indiana. In Illinois, we always have an attorney involved in real estate transactions, which which I love, right? Because it makes yep. my job easier and just coordinating the whole transaction easier. But in some of my other states where they're not attorney states, I often have clients say, oh, well, do we need to hire an attorney to help with the exchange? You know, I always say we can't provide any legal advice, but usually if it's a vanilla exchange, you and I can work on it together, you know, and get your CPA involved if needed. If it's a reverse, I say, yes, absolutely get an attorney involved. Um, these are you know, highly complex transactions. There's a lot of legal documentation that your attorney will need to review with you. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so the time periods are the same in these types of transactions. The client has 45 days from the purchase to identify what they're selling and 180 days to actually close on the sale. And then once the sale closes, the funds would come to a 1031 exchange escrow account, just like they would in a regular exchange. And then we would use those funds to either pay down the loan that the client took out to have us buy the property, or we would reimburse the client if they put up their own cash. And after that takes place, we would transfer that property to the client. So a couple takeaways. Reverse exchange, absolutely possible if they have to close on the purchase first. The reverse exchange must be set up prior to the closing of the purchase, and we need several more days than we would for a regular exchange to get that set up. Um, also, the fees are a bit higher, and if there's a lender involved, you want to get your lender on board with the process sooner rather than later. Because even though you're, you know, the taxpayer is guaranteeing the loan just like they normally would, we're the initial buyer and the initial borrower. There's also some non-recourse language we require, we require be placed in the loan docs, and there's some lenders that are not comfortable with all that. So before we go down this road where we say, here's a packet of information for your lender, talk it through with them, and then let's get on the phone with your attorney and, and get the process going. Uh, okay, here's our question. Can the seller or buyer live in the rental property part of the year? Currently, what is the rule? Okay, we did answer that, but maybe just cover that uh, one more time. Currently, what is the rule on how many months per year does it have to be rented to be considered an investment property? And so we 14, said 14 days, right? Yep, 14 days per year um, rental. And then personal use has to be limited to either 14 days or 10% of the rental period. Great. All right, Anna, we're coming up on, I, I, I love the questions. I love the, the buzz. We're coming up on an hour here. So I want to wrap up. Are there any final things that you want to say and then we'll just hear just briefly from our panelists to tie it up and then we'll have warren uh if he's uh, still on uh close the session yeah um and my next slide and I, I won't go through the whole slide i'll just mention my next slide was on the improvement exchange that i just mentioned which is a way that you could buy a property and then make improvements onto it within the exchange period so um you know the takeaway with all of these slides and the entire PowerPoint is just to kind of let you know what's possible. And when you're out there talking to your clients and really assessing what the 1031 opportunity is, and you hear one of these things come up, just give me a call um, and we can talk through it. Like I said earlier, I am absolutely happy to be your 1031 resource. You don't have to have a deal on your desk to call and, and brainstorm with me. So I'm happy to help. We also have tons of marketing materials. Some of the realtors I work with, um, I kind of use 1031s for their marketing purposes. Um, so if you'd like an article or some information to send out to your, your customers, please let me know. Great. Thank you, Anna. And so let's hear from our panelists just one more time. Uh, Felix, if you have anything just after you're now hearing the presentation, anything to add? Well, I think there's a few things. Uh, number one, the biggest takeaway is that if you're a agent and you're working with a client and you learn it's an investment property, this is something that should be brought up at the earliest opportunity possible. Number two, uh, make sure that your client has a good discussion with the accountant to determine whether or not the exchange makes sense under their given circumstances. And number three, there's an excellent team with uh, Anna and IPX that can help you out if you're ready to proceed forward with the 1031 exchange. Love it. Thank you, Felix. Uh, Juan, uh, anything that you want to add uh, to it? Yeah, absolutely. I just want to, you know, expand a little bit on, on the role of uh, the CPA in the 1031 exchange. Um, you know, it, it, it's the role of a CPA. It's really simple. You know, um, 
essentially it's to ensure that the taxpayer obtains the full tax deferral benefits that they're entitled to. You know, if you had to put it in one sentence, that's essentially what we're here for. Uh, and how is this done? Well, this is done by consulting with the taxpayer and ensuring that the exchange is in compliance with, you know, the internal revenue code and to help determine the, the best strategy to really execute, you know, the more complicated exchanges. Uh, the tax consulting, you know, it, it could be a variety of things, but, you know, if I could just mention uh, a few things here, for example, it could be to determine the viability of a cost segregation study to be used in conjunction with the 1031 exchange, which would be to maximize <clears throat> depreciation benefits post acquisition. Uh, it could be, you know, to determine if a reverse exchange is more appropriate than in their situation than a forward exchange. Or, you know, perhaps uh, to determine if a property requiring improvements is a viable candidate for an exchange. Anna touched a, a little bit on that. Um, or maybe, you know, maybe they're selling multiple properties and exchanging into a, uh, a larger, higher value asset or the opposite, going from one large asset into multiple smaller ones. That's where you really want to bring in your CPA and, you know, start that consulting process to make sure that you maneuver around all these requirements and that you walk away with a full tax deferral. I mean, bottom line, whatever your your complex situation is, the CPA is there to ensure that your structure and your metrics meet the 1031 requirements. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Sebastian, how about you? Any any uh, comments? Uh, no, uh, nothing, nothing really. Just, uh, yeah, just to make sure that the agents inform their clients because um, a lot of the clients have heard of a 1031 exchange, but they don't know how to go about it. And then, um, so as long as we're aware of that as the attorneys, um, then um, we can, you know, get this in, in order. Uh, so we're not scrambling last minute before, you know, uh, closing. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, Ernie, how about you? Any final uh, comments? Yeah, just real quick. Um, as you can tell, there are some layers to these things. So just make sure that the folks, even if, if the, the folks you normally work with have lots of real estate experience, make sure that they're familiar with these specific issues and that they've handled exchanges before, because there's not a lot of pitfalls for the attorneys, but they do exist. And there's ways that we can kind of get in the way of these things. So make sure that the folks you work with um, have experience. And second, a lot of these smaller investors they don't have accountants or they don't have experience with exchanges before. So uh, it's really one way you can add value as an agent is to have some referrals available for people who do have familiarity with this work because you don't want them browsing Google and, and popping on uh, to find some folks to help them with any really any part of the transaction. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great comment. You know, um, and I see we have a lot of our other attorney partners uh, on the call. And so I would, if you're an agent here and you're, thinking, oh, I would love to team up with an attorney, just reach out to your uh, land trust rep, uh, account executive, and they'll be able to connect you with, you know, uh, these uh, great attorneys. I know that you've been introduced to Felix, Ernie, Sebastian, and also Juan. And so thank you guys for your participation as well. And so I, if, I, if I wouldn't, uh, uh, Warren, if you wouldn't mind uh, just wrapping up this session, uh, our, our, the president of our title company, Warren Embi. Yeah, thanks, guys. Anna and our partner panelists, thank you so much for making a tough topic easy to understand. I just wish I had millions of dollars wrapped up in real estate right now so I can use your services. <laughs> maybe, my, maybe my kids, that'll be their turn. Uh, that's right. You know, uh, I just want to say to everybody that's on here, we get that a uh, closing is a vulnerable time and we're here to make it easy for you and help you even find uh, the right partners. So. Uh, we'd love to do business with you and uh, make it easy for you and your clients as well. So thank you, everyone. Great. And, and uh, thank you, Anna. You did a great job, a great presentation. You really did make it clear and ap appetizing to, you know, for agents to find investors with confidence that they know that there's a team of professionals where they can really be useful. And, and you know, uh, your knowledge becomes our power if we can leverage it that way. Um, and uh, someone asked if we're going to get the contact info, and we will send the contact info uh, for everyone, uh, for uh, Anna, and uh, you know, out to all of the registrants. So you will have Anna's uh, Anna Barsky's contact. You can find her on LinkedIn, though, very easily as well. But we'll get everyone the contact info. Um, so 
thank you very much for attending and let's have a great day. See you guys. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yep. Bye.